Hello and welcome to Perspectives. Coming to you from Bangkok, I'm Lian Pick. We've heard it all before after the Asian financial crisis, after the 2008 global financial crisis, after Enron, WorldCom, Lehman, Northern Rock, whoever and whatever was to blame for those corporate failures, one question was asked over and over again after those companies imploded. Where was the board? This being the fifth anniversary of the Lehman bankruptcy, it's fitting to see just how far we've come since that scary moment in 2008 when the collapse of Wall Street spread to Main Street, dragging most industrial countries into recession. Today, thank goodness, instead of where was the board, we ask a more constructive question. What should the board of tomorrow look like? While well, central banks, policymakers, companies have put in a lot of work into corporate governance since, how much have we learned about its value and what actually makes for effective corporate governance? Joining me is just the panel to answer these questions. Mrs. Somatai Panichewa, chairperson of the investment board of Amata Corporation, the largest listed conglomerate in the industrial estate sector on the Thai Stock Exchange. Mrs. Sumatai is CEO and President of Amata Vietnam and set up Amata's first overseas industrial estate in Vietnam. Dr. Roger Barker, Director of Corporate Governance and Professional Standards at the UK-based Institute of Directors. He sits on several governance advisory boards, including the European Confederation of Directors Associations. Tae Woon Tae, Managing Director of RSM Ethos, where he works closely with boards in designing risk management frameworks aligned with corporate strategy and governance. David Gerald, head of the Securities Investors Association of Singapore, the voice of retail investors, a former magistrate, lawyer, and prosecutor, David actively promotes investor education and regards himself a responsible activist. Dr. Bandit Nijatawan, President and CEO of the Thai Institute of Directors, also the Chairman of the Thai Bond Market Association. He is a former Deputy Governor of the Bank of Thailand. Welcome to Perspectives all of you. First off, let's uh, start with, with Roger. Since that crash um, in 2008 you know, caused a revolution in this space, how far do you think we've come in terms of corporate governance? I think we've come a good distance, but we have to be realistic that you know, corporate governance is a journey. Um, it's a work in progress. And time and time again, we see companies getting into difficulties. We see the challenges that boards face. There have been a lot of regulatory changes since the financial crisis, and I think boards themselves have really taken a, a good hard look at how they operate and can they up their game, because it's incredibly challenging mm -hmm. being on the board of directors of a major corporation. Mm -hmm. But there's still a long way to go, and to get to the board of tomorrow, I think you know, there, there are many changes, many developments that directors themselves and boards themselves yes. have to actually go through. All right, what about here in Asia then, Wintek? Let me draw you into the conversation. Yeah. Many listed companies here in Asia actually hail from uh, families, family-run businesses. Right. The bottom line has always been paramount, right? So how far have we come? How far has corporate reform um, actually come here in the region? Actually, I, I want to correct this uh, thinking that uh, family-managed business or controlling shareholders uh, actually the problems in corporate governance. Actually, they are not. If, if you bother to type uh, in uh, and ask Google what are the top 10 corporate scandals in the world, you will find names that are not owned by the family managed business. In fact, they are hired CEOs. Uh, I found that the governance standards in uh, family control business has improved not since, to, since 1997 after the Asian financial crisis. You look at uh, Asia. Uh, Yes, we have the global financial crisis, but not many Asian uh, controlled family business uh, went through a bad time. Mm -hmm. In fact, they have very strong balance sheets. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. that's a very good um, sort of uh, showing or report card for the likes of Samatai here, who yeah. obviously is, is on the investment board of Amata Corporation. And your brother, though, is the, the CEO of Amata. Yeah. But how do you counter this criticism, you know, that family-run businesses um, aren't really all that strong on corporate governance? I think the, uh, it's not wrong or mistake to have the family business, but how we can dress up this family business to be eternities and forever. 
how we can get the professional to involve with, how we can make to the corporate governance, how we can follow on the regulators. I think that is the challenge for those family business that they have to open, open to receive on that comment freedom. Mm -hmm. shareholders and uh, the board of directors including management upwards those family business have to open and really willing to change mm -hmm. I think that is the uh, the point mm -hmm. if they can do it and they can change it I think that they can close over on those problems. Well, you know, compared to your Western counterparts and, you know, companies in the West basically um, are facing a lot of pressure from shareholders, right, who are trying to engage them to get into the companies and look at the books and get more transparency. David, you know, you're a responsible activist. You regard yourself at, as one at least. Um, do you think that Asian companies have the incentive to actually reform their corporate governance uh, situations given the fact that comparatively there isn't so much pressure coming from the outside. Most Asian uh, countries, it is true, Thailand is an exception, Singapore is becoming an exception too. Uh, shareholders are becoming active uh, and they are demanding better accountability from the board. They are attending meetings, they are asking questions, intelligent questions, they are reading annual reports. Uh, but the way we want activism to develop, to bring about better governance, is responsible activism. The shareholders must feel that they are owners of the company and not they versus us. So what we try to do in, uh, is in Singapore in particular is to teach shareholders uh, to ask questions with decorum and with responsibility and to move the board towards the concerns that they have and to resolve the concerns in an amicable, amicable way. So can therefore governance improve through this method? Yes, mm -hmm. governance is improving pretty fast uh, through this collaborative effort rather than a contentious effort. Mm -hmm. Do you see a difference between larger uh, listed entities and yes. smaller listed entities, you know, between the middle to lower rung companies? Perhaps they are the ones who don't really want to be in the public arena. Well, the, the MNCs, I mean, the NDs, you know, TLCs, we call them in Singapore, the Tamasegon companies uh, with the sovereign funds. The com these companies have got the resources mm -hmm. to have the professionals to help them develop better corporate governance practices. The middle and the smaller ones often um, are found wanting in certain areas, especially risk management, internal controls. Why? Because they, they tend to save cost and they want to show the bottom line pretty, uh, you know, obviously they want to show that they're doing well. What they forget is that to manage a scandal is much more expensive than to have the safeguards in place. Okay. Let's draw Dr. Bandit into the conversation yes. because, you know, corruption and bribery, you know, that's been plaguing financial markets here in Asia for the longest time. Do you think that's the biggest challenge uh, to companies in Asia as far as corporate governance goes? Yes, I think it's a global problem, especially for big companies. And you know, large corporation listed companies stay in Thailand can also send a signal that you know, for the longer term sustainability of business, maybe we should go to promote clean business. I think that's a key message, and uh, it's part of the good corporate governance. You know, this duty of obedience in the sense that you are actually, you know, doing things according to the law. And I think it's uh, issues of, you know, one company cannot actually come up and announce that I want to go for clean business. Mm -hmm. You must have a lot of companies to, 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 to be doing similar things. Okay. And I think like in the case of Thailand, we have a, a, a project, you know, the Collective Action Coalition of the Private Sector Against Corruption. And many listed companies are coming forward to, to enroll in this program to send a signal, you know, to, to, to the world that company listed in Thailand having this platform that we can launch a clean business. So I think this is part of the awareness and the governance improvement that, that we have been talk, talking about.
Okay, well, well, let's try to get to the crux of what makes for good governance. You know, what makes for value-creating governance? A lot has been made of independent directors, as if somehow or other they are the ones who are really going to keep the board and the company on the straight and narrow. But really, Roger, wouldn't you say that there are lots of studies which, which show that there isn't a real link between board independence and board performance? Well, the problem is actually measuring true independence because, I mean, what you really want is a board that thinks for itself. You, know, you want board members around the table, whether or not they tick the independence box, who are truly going to think what is in the best interests of the company here. And a lot of the studies, of course, find it difficult to, to measure that true independence. There are plenty of studies, though, I should mention, which show that if you do have a significant number of independent directors on the board, mm -hmm. the valuation of your company will increase mm -hmm. and you will have better um, operational success. Mm -hmm. So I do think that that's important. Mm -hmm. But you, I think you need many things in, in a good director. Mm -hmm. Independence is definitely one of them. You need that the directors, of course, have expertise and knowledge of the business, you know, a real mm -hmm. passion for the business. I mean, S Steve Jobs, when he was running Apple, um, when he was looking for a director, it was incredibly important for him mm -hmm that the directors had a passion for Apple products. Yes. And whenever he appointed a director, he would typically list mm -hmm. the Apple products they, they would be using um, in their normal business lives. Mm -hmm. So that's also important, but okay. having, yes. having that combination. Sure. Yes. But what about the sense that external directors don't necessarily have the expertise, the domain expertise perhaps of the company per se? And also, you know, a lot of cynics always feel that directors are really quite decorative and but pretty much useless because, you know, they're there and they ask a couple of questions um, every time the meeting comes up. Yes. What do you all think? Investors are more comfortable with companies that have true independence on the board. Why? They want watchdogs. It's natural, you put your money in, you're not in the boardroom. Boards meet in uh, privacy, behind closed doors. They come out with annual reports, but the investors do not have a say in the running of the company, right? So they want people on the board who would safeguard their interests. In Asia, it is true to say it's far more you find far more interdependent in, uh, directors than independent directors. Because the source of appointment is not independent. The directors, independent directors, so-called independent directors, who are actually non-executive directors in corporate law, uh, come from the majority controlling uh, investor, controlling shareholder. So uh, we find that uh, to find truly independent people, when they come from outside the jurisdiction or from areas which are not connected with the company, at all, mm -hmm. in terms of business, in terms of uh, you know relationships, uh, they are independent. But very soon, what happens is that they become very familiar with the the, the board, and and they forget their role. Mm -hmm. They are expected to protect the interests of the minority. Okay, as uh, David was saying, Asia might be suffering from having too many interdependent directors, not enough independent directors. We got to take a commercial break now. Stay with us here on Perspectives. Welcome back to Perspectives. We're talking about the board of tomorrow here in Bangkok. Now, you know, we were talking about how the structure of the board is important, how independent directors are crucial to the board. But really, isn't it also about board dynamics? If you haven't got a collaborative um, CEO and, you know, directors who actually got their authority and are willing to challenge, how effective is this board going to be? You know, I think the chairman is incredibly important here in terms of creating the right sort of behavioral dynamics on the board. Because what you're wanting to do in a board is bring in different perspectives and different ideas so that people can identify and think about the different risks and opportunities which are facing the company. So if that isn't happening, if there is just groupthink on the board, yes. then really you don't have the benefit of group decision making. Yes, groupthink is really important, right? Because when we looked at a lot of uh, uh, boards of failed companies, really it wasn't that the boards didn't have fantastic individuals on them. Some of them had great individuals, but collectively somehow they weren't having the sort of quality conversations that are necessary, won't they? No, I, I agree. I, I find 
that uh, this concept of independence and the, uh, the, you, you need to have a separate chairman and a CEO not really helping board performance in the context of Asia. Uh, I think the challenge today we have is how do we move the board of the future from a stewardship model, complying with governance and law, to a leadership model. Uh, to do that shift from a stewardship model to a leadership model, you need to have very progressive boards. Now, we have a situation today where people like Gerald right, talk about shareholders' activism uh, and you encourage more independence. Uh, and I think the, the Asian boards are following that. Uh, they, they have uh, independent directors. But you know, one of the biggest problems today we have is you have a very liberated board that every independent directors come in, they say their peace of mind, they look at micro issues, they are not really leading the boards okay, in a very progressive way, collaborating with the CEOs. Um, I like to see the future board moving from a liberated board where the, the independent directors are worried about their legal liabilities and the first thing they ask is what is your DNO insurance cover? I like to see that moving to a more progressive board where they look at how do I grow the business mm -hmm. and what it takes to build sustainability. I think that's important. Yeah. So yeah. when it comes to progressive boards, I mean, you know, for a family-run business, right, yeah. um, and you have a lot of people in the family on, on, on various boards, etc. So again, how do you stay open to opinions? I think the vision is very important. And then the sustainability is very important for the companies, how we can make our company get longer and forever. We cannot be run the company as the three or four generations. That is no more. But how we can make it into 10 or 20? So the, that is the very important. Sustainability is how to make it. Amata have the, this in our DNA. Because our customers, once we get into our city, our area, we have to serve them up to the end. So we have no time to exit. So how we can cooperate with them up until the end or, or, or whatever. So that is very important. Sustainability is not a choice, but we have to do it. Mm -hmm. So how we do it, this is very, very challenge. Mm -hmm. So how do we actually create this challenge culture that's actually needed? Now, if you look at the scandals, uh, Enron, WorldCom, and in Asia, the China Aviation Oil, it's a strong CEO, CEO and uh, one who is able to overcome the board, one who would do uh, what he wishes to do. If the board takes the hands off the handle, uh, handles, very often you leave things to the CEO. He does not very often own. He doesn't have ownership in the company. He takes the ship down with him. Uh, that's the reason why I say that the board of the future must ensure that they have the control. Mm -hmm. They set the direction. Talking about CEOs and stewardship, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. stewardship can get to get very extreme. So you have a CEO who really manages the flow of information. They are in such control of the board. They literally almost stage manage board meetings. So then, then how do you actually challenge somebody like that? I mean, what is the role of uh, directors then in a situation like this? I think uh, the key issue here is effective oversight of the company's uh, strategies and also operation, including also corporate governance. The key issue here is in order to raise the board effectiveness, you need to have the people there first, the people who will inform about the business of the company. And then uh, this, this uh, board, we need to be supported by a process that is open, transparent, and in, you know, that allow for a lot of open debate, exchange of views. And this is where the chairperson comes in, that he has to create this environment of free flows of, of debate and, and thinking and, and encourage the board members to, to think beyond the immediate issues. That how we have this concept of a strategic board where you look for the issues of tomorrow. You look long term, right? And you, you tend to look in terms of su uh, sustainability. But this sort of idea is then once one is, uh, once it, uh, one is sort of uh, happens in the board, then it becomes a chemistry of how to get vision made by utilizing you know, the best available expertise that we have in the, in, in the boards. 
So I think the key moving parts would be the, the board member himself mm -hmm. and then the board process. Investors will demand in future that the nomination process be transparent. We need to know who is actually being brought on to the board before we invest in the company. Mm -hmm. In New Zealand, the directors have to address shareholder meetings, then tell why they have opted to serve on the board. Since 2008, basically the risk of board service has become so much higher. So mm -hmm. do you think that it's become harder really to find uh, members to join the board where they feel they really don't have all that much oversight over what is important? I think it's going the, op the opposite. Uh, when things get more demanding, you get more professional people that want to get involved because they are better prepared you know, to handle the issues. Is that true? Well, I, mean, what, yeah, what I, I must say we find in Europe is that particularly in relation to financial institutions and banks, a lot of people are turning their backs on serving on boards because it's so complex. You know, these organizations are huge, the risks are enormous, there is huge regulatory pressure, so it, it, it's a real issue. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it is incredibly difficult sitting on the board of a major organization. In the past, uh, there were concerns that independent directors were serving on too many boards. I guess that issue has resolved itself then in the, in the West. To some extent it has. I mean, it, it is still an issue. Um, there's, a, there's talk about whether there should be numerical limits on the number of boards you can sit on. Yes. But of course, that's all very arbitrary. I mean, what's the right number? Four, five, yeah, six, yeah. seven. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, ultimately, I think the nomination committee of the board has to look at each candidate and decide, you know, What's the, is it right to give the job to this person? Sure, or not? sure. The downside to this is, you know, if there are limits, uh, you know, on number of wards which uh, company directors, etc., can join, like here yeah. in, in Thailand. Yeah. I mean, that's also bad because basically you won't be able to find the right mm -hmm. and suitable candidates from the right business sectors which are appropriate to your sector. What do you say? What they're afraid of. They're afraid of a climb in the future that they may have. But if we set up a good performance, a kind of the KPI, you know, and uh, they learn how to perform the board. As Dr. Buddy said, I don't think that difficult to find them. I think a lot of pub public company have to interview them who is good and fit with you. I think that is no, the yeah, more, I mean, more people think, coming uh, and show up. I mean, of course, in the banking, sector yeah. is different. The business is complex. It's a huge, gigantic organization, and you're there, you know, maybe once a month. So it, it's different. But it, in terms of directorship as a career, I think we see trends moving into that direction. Mm -hmm. You see people want to be equipped to become professional board directors. And these people would actually, you know, go about, get training, and learn all the pieces yeah. so that they are more you know, more prepared. And if you look at big companies, now they go to use uh, human resource services, headhunter, yeah. to yeah. search for yeah. the best people. So I think the, uh, the chemistry, the moving parts are changing. Yes, I believe there is enough talent. Question is, is there a willingness to search for the talent? Yes. Uh, if, if they're using search firms and if they're really wanting professionalism on the board, they, there are lawyers, there are accountants, there are financial uh, personnel, there are, you know, auditors, there are enough people. And secondly, for the liability the directors face today, they need to be paid well. You need to pay them well. Well, they're getting, <laughs> if you throw peanuts, you get monkeys. So yeah, they need to be to. paid well. Yeah. All right, yeah. is there enough talent out there to fill our boards? And of course, you know, as the old adage goes, if you pay peanuts, you might just well get monkeys. That uh, takes us to another break. Stay with us here on Perspectives. Welcome back to Perspectives. Now, if it's so difficult to actually find qualified professional directors to sit on boards, um, that really brings us to the question really of uh, why can't we have more board diversity, right? Why can't we have more women? Why can't we have more people of different races, different ages, etc.? This really makes the case for that. It does. I think that you know, we have quite a narrow view of who should be a director. 
tends to be the current CEO of another company or a former CEO, I think we've got to be much more imaginative. And what happened, for example, in Norway, in, in Europe, they introduced overnight a quota, a 40% quota for female board members. And of course, they had to then go out and find those people, those women, to serve on the boards. And they had to be imaginative. They had to look to middle management and the professions. Mm -hmm. And you know, suddenly, um, boards opened up to a lot of new people. Right. Now, in Asia, in Singapore at least, is about 6% of female representation on boards, right? Here in Thailand, I believe, is about 15% representation. Do you think we should have a quota? I don't think that they have any ratio for that. But I feel that the men have their, their strength. Women also have that strength. That's why they call yin yang. You know, the, that is the couple. So I think that the woman can be filled up for the gap that the man don't have. But in the same time, the man can fill up the thing that women can don't have. So this thing has to be together. I cannot say that it must be at 40%. As at, it it depends on the capabilities. Yeah. And I believe that in the future, women will get stronger and stronger. Yeah. I believe that. It's not yes. the unwillingness to have women on the board. Women are good on the board and good to have them on the board if they're talented, if they're useful, if they bring uh, a benefit to the board. Yeah. But it is, it is very dangerous, in my view, to have a quota and force the board to look for women because we want quality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Investors want quality. Investors do not want any woman yeah. sitting on the board. We have to, to ask the question of what is the issue. I think I support the issues of board diversity yes. as a way of getting the best people, best qualified, Absolutely. best talent on board. And if you ask companies here in Thailand, that is the key issue, regardless of the gender. Yes. Mm -hmm. If the, a female person fits, then she gets a job. If the male person fits, they get a job. So it's the talent and the expertise that comes first. Oh, this, right. is a, this is a business concern. Yep. But yeah. when you talk about gender as an issue, it's become a social concern. In the case of Thailand, you know, we don't have that Amy's. difficulty yet yeah. because our number showed at about 15%. Of, of the board uh, are female, but in countries like other countries in Asia, maybe it's seven or eight, you know, so people rest. You mean Thai women are more liberated? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think, you know, we, I, I don't want to, 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 to say that we need to put some number on. And if, you know, in the case of the Nordic countries, 40%, yes. it depends on how it's evolved. Yes. The role women played in, in society, a family role, and then when they got liberated, they got on to jobs, corporate jobs, and to expect them to do board work as well as family work was a bit too onerous. So we saw very few women putting up their hand, all right? Now these days, with, you know, more help, uh, they're able to, some of them are able to come on board. But I think to say that you must have a quota and force boards to look for women is go not going to be good for diversity. Two years ago, we had about 10% of women on boards in, in UK companies. In the space of two years, it's gone from 10% to 17%. Yes. And the main reason for that is that the government has said, look, either you get your house in order in terms of having more women on the board, or we are going to introduce quotas. Yes. And of course, the companies don't want quotas. I mean, most companies don't want quotas. Um, but they've had to realize that they have to act. I understand that the UK companies are actually tapping uh, women from the United States for their boards. And if that can happen, I mean, why can't we look beyond you know, the, the, our shores, our individual shores, yes. for talent from overseas? Yeah, like I said, there must be the willingness to do that. And I think uh, shareholders should now push from the ground. Why aren't any women on the board? If you're talking about gender diversity, but if there is diversity on the board and uh, women have to be appointed, it's a board decision. And what's good for the company is good for the shareholders. And of course, in Singapore now, there is a movement to ask for, you know, to push for gender um, diversity. But the shareholders will have to be satisfied that it's good for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tapping talent from overseas, will take your view? Well, I think that's, that's very important. Uh, we are basically very connected today. Uh, uh, and Human capital, uh, and if you really want to talk about uh, diversity, different background, different culture, it's very important because today, even if you're in Thailand, your businesses are global, right? So, so you need a perspective from people in Vietnam, from US, from Russia, right, to, to give you a, a view. Uh, 
I, I think it is more than just gender diversity. Uh, what we really want is uh, to prevent group thinking. If you look at the Japan food scandal, it's so obvious. Right? It's all men, uh, uh, friendly <laughs> network, right? Uh, and you have scandals like this. Uh, and I think the, the, whole, the, the whole challenge from the board is uh, they got to cast the net white, use search firm, take the nomination process uh, very seriously, like any other election, right? Uh, and find the best people into the board. The other thing I just want to correct is uh, you can't look at the uh, Singapore ratio, the board uh, representation by, by the female and say we are very low. Actually, even in my organization, two-thirds of my senior executive are, are, are female. And, and oh, wow. you know, in the, in the, in the governance uh, space that I'm in, all right, honestly, all right, I have five women telling me what to do and advising me. And if I ask them, right, uh, take over my job, right? Yes. They don't want. And that's yeah. often actually yeah. the key problem. There's a key problem. Yes. On the boards is actually the, the pipeline of women coming through executive positions. Um, so if you have that, that's a very mm. positive development. One way yeah. to, to sort of try to get a solution to this is to make sure that in the nomination process, yeah. the board give importance to the issues of diversity, full stop. Yes. In terms of knowledge, expertise, and talent. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then let the market or let you know let the uh, let the natural process come up with the best uh, candidate. Let's talk about shareholder activism, okay? I mean that that's been sending shivers down the spines of a lot of corporates. You know, in the past, I think companies were very afraid of hostile takeover bids, and 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 now it, they're afraid of activist shareholders. Are companies again? Are they prepped to face? Um, these external challenges. I, my company actually have that kind of things when we have the shareholder meeting, which is uh, even annually. But uh, this is very important for the chairman to handle on this kind of thing. But one thing that we have to do it openly, what kind of comment that those shareholders have? I think this is very important. We can't say that no, no, no. But we have to listen. What is their comment? If it's good, we have to change. We have to collect it. If they don't understand, they have to unclear something, we have to make it clear. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the thing that we have to clear and we have to talk to them directly. We can't just deaf. Yes. You in can't the, do in that. In the past, a lot of companies you know, basically turned deaf when, when the activist shareholders turned up. They didn't want to deal with them. They didn't want to listen. Really, yeah. that's not tenable anymore, right, in this yeah. day and age, Changing. given social media yes. and you know, the fact that people want no. answers. The board of tomorrow will have to communicate with shareholders. A There's lot. a push from the ground for better accountability, and shareholders are becoming vocal. And in Singapore, we are organized. Shareholders by themselves alone don't make a difference, but when they're organized, they make a huge difference. Yeah. But at the same time, what we are advocating is responsible shareholder activism. That the shareholders must feel that they are owners of the company, and it's not they versus us, but we all have to do something together to make the company better. So responsible shareholder activism is getting the ears uh, and getting the voice heard. And I think this is what is also happening in. Thailand and other parts of Asia now. Shareholders are able to understand annual reports, able to understand the corporate strategies. And it's education, education, education. Right, so there's no running away from activist shareholders. We've got to take another break now. Stay with us here on Perspectives. I think it, it's linked to what we said in the beginning of the program, you know, the financial crisis. That then, you know, this disappointment with what happened, they want to be heard, they want their views, uh, you know, to be recognized. And there are ways in which these are being communicated to both to, to the market and also to the companies. But I see it's a positive trend, right? Because what are they saying? They're helping you to identify the, the issues that you might not think of. 
And if you look, you know, what has been the issue that, you know, shareholders activism has been focusing on throughout the, the region, I would probably come down to three issues. The first one is risk management, right? Things like TEPCO, right? To be, to, to, to inform the board that they need to do better on important issues. And then on the questions of corporate governance, you know, they, they want more demand on how the board pay attention. And lastly, on issues of executive compensation. I mean, these are the three recurring theme, you know, with shareholders, activism. So I think I agree that it's a trend will continue. Companies will learn to adapt and they recognize it and give it a space and how to deal with it positively. Right, right. but some companies are actually so par paranoid that they're even inviting some of these activists onto, into their boardrooms you know, to discuss how they would launch an attack on the company and all that. I mean, are, are companies, in, in your opinion, you know, really prepped to, to meet these shareholders even before they, they knock on the door? Yes, they are, because I think there's two types of shareholder relationship. There is stewardship. You know, which is ownership, a good relationship on an ongoing basis between shareholders and companies. You know, and that's to be welcomed. And most progressive companies would absolutely welcome that. Mm -hmm. But then there is a quite uh, destructive type of activism, which is very short-termist in nature. Mm -hmm. And it's shareholders who are coming into a company, perhaps they take quite a small stake, they try to rally other shareholders to the cause to do something which is uh, pretty short-termist. And to give you an example of that, Three years ago, some hedge funds essentially approached Vodafone and said, we want you to sell your uh, Verizon wireless subsidiary. You must do it. You must unlock the value now. Mm. And Vodafone said, no, we're not going to do this. It isn't the right moment to, uh, to be taking mm. this step. Mm. And this year, they have spun it off and actually uh, raised three times more revenue for that mm. sale than they would have done if they'd followed the activist requirements three years ago. Right. So I think, you know, as a director, as an independent director, you have to think for yourself. You don't just follow what the market yes. is saying at any point in time. You have yes. to have an independent mindset. I mean, basically, activism doesn't have to be all bad. I mean, if no. they don't no. go direct to the public yes. straight away, they engage the company yeah. first and mm -hmm. see whether they can come up with something yeah. that is well, constructive. The brand of activism that we have developed in Singapore is tripartism. You cannot beat majority, the tyranny of the majority at meetings. They will vote against you. So what we do is we have started an activism that is in the boardroom and not in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. So we engage the board and we have a constructive engagement and where there is an issue is a tripartism between the stock exchange with the board and the shareholders sit together and we resolve issues. Mm -hmm. And we have resolved an enormous number of cases mm -hmm. quietly without affecting the share value mm -hmm. of the shareholders. Now, even if companies are doing the right thing, do you think that they are communicating in the right way uh, to their shareholders? Are they engaging their shareholders enough in, in terms of telling them, hey, this is, this is what we've done by way of corporate governance? Well, I, I think uh, uh, the, the current board today uh, failed in embracing social media. I think they, they have to communicate uh, not just in the AGM, but also engage the social media. Yeah. Take for example, uh, this nine-year-old girl went to the McDonald's AGM and asked uh, the McDonald's CEO, you're selling me junk food, right? Uh, and you know, this thing went broadcast in the social media and went viral. Now you, you got to have a strategy to deal with that, right? And you, and you got to have a strategy to engage the social media that you're not selling junk food. Otherwise, it can have a adverse uh, impact on your brand equity. And this is an area where I find many bots fail to recognize. And they got to put in effort to build, to build resources uh, on how to engage social media. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of companies have actually put in a lot of money into investor relations of late, you know, and instead of sending out the head of the investor relations company and they're sending out the CFO, the CEO, the CEO, you know, whatever it takes mm -hmm. to engage, is that the way to go? Yep. I think that the, uh, as the, he said that, you cannot communicate with the shareholder only the, uh, the meeting of the shareholders, but you have to do through all the network. TGI Friday, Twitter, Google, Instagram, and Facebook. It's needed. Those are the communication that really update and innovative, and very, very fast to give them to understand out of the annual shareholder what else that we have to give to them day by day, month by month. Then they understand what's going on. 
once they understand what's going on, it's, it's a kind of like I feel control. Yes. You know, the shareholder feel relief. Mm. Yes. Once they feel relief, they don't let any annoying question to you. Yes. Well, if you look at the crisis scandals, many of the crisis, corporate crisis arises due to lack of communication. Yeah. And in Asia, many of the companies, most of the companies are yet to indulge in uh, social media communication. Yes, yes, communication is key. Well, we're going to be wrapping up right now because uh, I'm afraid we're running out of time. So uh, let me guess, get some last words from our panel. Dr. Bandit, let me start with you. What is the most important um, governance change you would like to see in Asia? I think Asia has come a long way from the uh, situation in the late 1990s with a crisis in terms of improvement in corporate governance. So I think the next big step for tomorrow would be actually walk the talk. You know, I mean, the processes, the policy, ticking the box have all been done. The next key issue is, of course, you know, to actually do it, to walk the talk, to actually implement the policy mm -hmm. that has been so this is the issues of substance over form, actually do it. And then the second issue would be uh, what I spoke uh, earlier. We are looking for ethical board, the, okay. the board that could build and construct you know, an ethical culture for the organization. All right. Roger, last word from you. Please. Yes. I mean, we've discussed how family businesses are very strong in Asia. You know, I think that model it has many advantages and is a very positive thing. But what I would like to see for the future is that the board of directors of these companies and other companies is really is the key decision-making body of the company. Yes, the owners will always have a say. They will always play a key role in appointing some of the directors. But we really need boards that think for themselves in the best interest of the company because that is actually what makes a company sustainable in the longer term, mm -hmm. having an independent board. Mm -hmm. Sumha Tang, how do you intend to keep your company prospering and also managing your board in such a way that it ensures that? I need my board in three things. Firstly, on the people. People have to be diversity. People have to be more uh, flexible and also the vision. And then the second one, I need to, f to see on the process. How is the policy is going and then going to be on the CSR and the CG corporate governance, how they can do implementations. And then the lastly is performance. After they have been done on the process, what is the performance on that? How they can do the evaluation, self-evaluation mm -hmm. for keep up on the future. So that is, I think, I would like to see my board for tomorrow equipped with the new technologies that they have to go and modernize in the future. As a city developer, as Amata, we cannot just be here. We have to keep up with the value added. All so right. that's what I would like to see my board there. Wun Teik, fundamentally, would you say that good governance also means practicing good capitalism? Capitalism yes. that is going to be good for society. My, my view is uh, the, the, the future board has to embrace this concept of innovate to zero. What do I mean? Typical current board, if they look at growing capitalism, they grow by acquiring land, add people, add capital. These are what I call a resource-intensive model. Mm -hmm. The future board has to look at how to grow by focusing more on the intellectual capital, social capital, and the moral capital. I think we, we need to, to, to think of co-dependent system, right? how to collaborate, and, uh, and you know, the ASEAN Economic uh, uh, Council, the forum, if we ever do the ASEAN, now it's a one way of uh, collaborating all right? uh, without uh, creating uh, more physical assets. Right? And, the world has to learn how to collaborate, share, co-dependent uh, to build a better tomorrow. All right, David, yeah. last word to you. The boards of tomorrow must uh, be serious about diversity, bring professionalism on the board. They must be serious about engaging shareholders constructively, allow them to participate and communicate effectively. 
All right, I'm afraid that's all the time we have uh, today on Perspectives. That really brings us to the end of our program. I'd like to thank my guests, Sumhatai Panichewa of Amata Corporation, Dr. Roger Barker from the UK Institute of Directors, Tay Woon Take, Managing Director of RSM Ethos, David Gerald from the Securities Investors Association of Singapore, and Bandit Nija Tawan from the Thai Institute of Directors. It is clear that while boards will continue to thread the needle between compliance and performance, the revolution in public company governance is here to stay. The irony, of course, is that as directors and boards better meet the challenges that they face, expectations of their performance will rise even more. That's it for Perspectives. I'm Bian Peck. Thanks for joining us here in Bangkok.